Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Can I have your attention? I'm James Heimowitz. I'm the president of China Institute. And a big welcome to all of you. As we're getting ready to get started, I'm just thinking, everybody's hovering around there. If you'd like, the speakers are going to be here. So if it's better, feel free while I'm talking, because I'm not the important one, and move yourself over to here. You may be able to feel more comfortable um, watching. In the meantime, I'll just sort of welcome everybody. As I said, I'm James Heimowitz. For those of you that don't know China Institute, China Institute was founded in 1926. And for over 90 years, we've been helping Americans to get a little deeper, more nuanced understanding about China through art, through education, through culture, and through business. Um, we're a totally non-political organization, and we're committed to giving Americans the tools to be able to better understand what's happening in China and to be able to relate to this country. Because it all comes from a place that we believe that we share a shared future. And there are no more than the two most important countries on this planet, unquestionably now, and for the next chunk of time, in my belief, are China and the US. So today, um, we're here for an executive summit. The business component of China Institute um, is a relatively new component to it, um, dating back only 20 or 25 years, considering that we've been around for 95 years. One little uh, side fact I'll tell you, um, in 95 years, we've touched nearly a million people in the school teaching them to understand and appreciate China through the Chinese language program. For those of you that have a chance, you're welcome. Please come visit us. We have new headquarters down at 100 Washington Street. Um, we moved from 9,000 square feet to 52,000 square feet, and we just wrapped up phase two of our campaign, successfully raising nearly $7.5 million, which is gonna enable us to have an entrance to the street and reach an even broader um, public. So today, without further ado, um, I want to welcome and to say a big thank you to our sponsors, Citibank. Um, our chair, Jay Collins, who's vice chair for international, isn't here today, but we're very grateful for Citibank to making this space available to us and for helping us co-sponsor this event, along with our today's sponsors, Wanxiang and United Airlines and all of our corporate members who are here today. Um, on that note, I know we have tons, tons ahead of us, and I also just want to do a quick shout out to my trustees. Let's see who are my trustees that are here. I saw we have Vincent Mo. We have our vice chair, Anla Cheng. Where's Anla? Here. Hi. Next to her, Pete Walker, Mike Krupa, Yvonne Wong, Ingrid Ehrenberg. And have I missed anybody? I think that's and Vincent Mo, who I said in the beginning, who gets the award for coming the farthest from Beijing. So thank you all for all your support. So China can't stop being in the news. And today, we're trying our very, very best to at least understand one very important component of this relationship. And it's about technology and about finance. And I didn't come here to steal the thunder from my colleague, Dinda Elliott, who's been working so hard and pull it, to pull this off. So I will hand it over to her to tell us a little bit more about the content about today. Thank you. Hi. Oops, excuse me, James. Um, so I'm going to use the mic. Forgive me, but it's because I have a lot of thank yous, and I don't want to forget anybody. Um, so, you know, it's, I'm Dinda Elliott. I'm the director of programs at China Institute. And um, we're really thrilled to have you all here today. Um, it's, it's no exaggeration to say that technology rules our lives and will do so even more in the future. So the way in which technology develops and where and how it develops is going to matter to each and every one of us. Uh, today we're going to talk about everything from U.S.-China competition in the tech sphere, who will dominate the technologies of the future, to where the most exciting technologies are, especially in China. <laughs> and to how we can drive technology in a positive direction to ensure that it makes our lives better and freer. Um, some of the questions that we hope to address today include, um, you know, we seem to have two entirely separate tech universes emerging, one based on WeChat and Alipay and a 996 lifestyle, nine to nine, working nine to nine, six days a week. And the other one based around email, WhatsApp, and what's maybe a more laid-back Silicon Valley ethos. 
Um, given the current tensions between the United States and China, are we destined to have two entirely separate tech universes increasingly walled off from each other? And will fears of cyber theft and unfair trade practices wall us off even further? Despite the current trade war, how can tech businesses work across borders to reach new markets in China and the United States? So China, with its Made in, Made in China 2025 plan, seems to be set to zoom ahead of the United States. We've all heard about the street beggars in Beijing carrying QR codes and the cashless society. And um, ITE, the Netflix of China, which we will hear about, um, we'll hear more from them later today, they're using AI already today to design content, including casting roles and even script writing. So will China be the winner? Or are there aspects of China's culture and the top-down political system that will hold innovation back? Today, we're going to look at all of these questions. Um, we hope the conversations today will challenge your preconceptions and that you'll go home feeling that you've learned things that will help you think more strategically and, and make wiser investments. I have a number of thank yous this morning. In addition to our wonderful summit sponsors, City, Wanxiang, and United, we're also grateful to all of our corporate and global council members who support us throughout the year. China Construction, City, Haitong Securities, Gemdale, Lifestyle, Ling Ray, Morgan Stanley, Shan Cha, Tronics, and Wanxiang. Thank you all so much. Uh, I also want to thank our strategic partners uh, who have helped us to um, spread the word about this conference, help us reach out to speakers, and those include SubChina, the Chinese Financial Association, the Asian Finance Association, Chong Kong Graduate School of Business, China Europe International Business School, the Committee of 100, the China Association of Science and Technology, and the Hong Kong Trade Development Council for helping, again, to get the word out about today's conference. Um, we are delighted that our media partners today are Bloomberg, South China Morning Post, and Itai Global. And we're very happy to welcome Joanne Chu, Hong Kong's chief uh, representative in New York. And we're also delighted to have China's science and technology consul, Mr. Xing Jijun, join us today. So thanks for being here. Uh, I want to thank also the whole China Institute team for today's event. The pros in our marketing team have been working hard to get word out. Thank you, Jeremy and Sveta. I hope you're here someplace. Um, and to Rachel Strader, who is our events producer, thank you for running such a tight ship. Um, but I have a very special shout out to my colleague, Nina Huang. Nina, you got to pay attention. I'm giving you a shout out. <laughs> Nina is my true partner in conceptualizing, researching, outreach, and organization of this event. And this conference would never have happened without you, Nina. Thank you. Um, now I'm delighted to, to introduce Kathy Huang. Is Kathy Huang here? Wonderful. OK. Director, head of China Desk, North, North America, Citicorp, and Investment Bank. Um, and I want to give a special thanks to our wonderful trustee, Jay Collins, who's vice chairman of Citi, as James mentioned, and also to Lee Wong who has at Citi, who has really championed our partnership and made this all happen. Without their support, this event literally could not have happened. And so our gratitude goes way beyond words. So over to you, Kathy. Thank you. I'm going to take those in my hands. OK. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of everyone in the city, I would like to first bid you a very warm welcome to today's China Institute Executive Summit. City is honored to partner with China Institute to host the event today, where the gray minds meet. So the, today's topic, as uh, Dinda so eloquently summarized, next frontier between US and China, innovations, technologies, a topic dear to our hearts. City started its operations in China in 1902 in the city of Shanghai. Since then, China has become one of the most strategically important markets at city. With a global network that spans over 100 countries, city supports global companies doing business in China, and Chinese companies 
in its overseas expansions. Innovation, partnerships run deep in our DNA. We believe in partnerships that marry innovation and scale. Innovation, partnerships that promote financial inclusion. Partnerships that create new models and help strengthen old models in new ways. So as we all, as James and Dinda both mentioned, there is the trade war in the background, right? In the most publicized trade war of US and uh, China, we have seen that perhaps some signs of the talks edging towards a deal. But if we take a step back, behind all of that is the great struggle for global supremacy between the two largest economies on Earth. The struggle across economic growth, diplomacy, military, and technology. Despite of all the bumps and challenges and competitions, we believed that the two countries can work together in many areas, technology development being one of them. So today, we are very happy to see the leaders in technology and representatives from business communities from both China and the United States gathering here to discuss technology, innovation, partnership, and collaboration. City is proud to play an important role in promoting a more effective collaboration, and we trust the power of the gray minds in this room today is going to help build that bridge to a bright, shared economic future of the United States and China. Thank you. That's wonderful, Kathy. Thanks. Um, OK, so it's my pleasure to announce our first dialogue. Um, Slava Rubin is a force of nature. Uh, he launched his Indiegogo's crowdsourcing company in 2007 and has built it into one of the largest in the world. But what interests us especially about Slava today is that he says that China has become the biggest driver of his business. He's going to talk about why that is, what the challenges are, and what kinds of possibilities he sees in the areas of US-China tech collaboration. And interviewing him today is Adi Ignatius, editor-in-chief of Harvard Business Review, who also happens to be my husband. So come on up to the stage, please. <laughs> Uh, so James's call for everyone to move from there to there, it, everyone moves sub basically from the far left to the far right. I don't know if that's a Donald Trump effect or a Xi Jinping effect, but <laughs> we're seeing it happen right before our eyes. Um, so I, uh, uh, Slava, as Dinda said, is a force of nature, is you know, a, a great entrepreneur, is doing a lot of interesting stuff. He's optimistic about China. He sits at the crossroads of the topics that we want to talk about today, which is technology and finance. And, um, but before we talk about China, I would love, you know, I, I, you know, Indiegogo, of course, was one of the first uh, crowdfunding sites, maybe the first, um, one of the biggest for sure. I'm guessing maybe a lot of people know exactly what it is, maybe some people don't. So maybe we could start a little bit talking about your origin story, how you became Slava Rubin Entrepreneur, and then a little bit about how Indiegogo got started. Uh, sure. Um, so I was born in Belarus, actually, and then uh, came over to uh, Brooklyn and Pennsylvania. I went to the Wharton School. I was undergrad, a finance and entrepreneurship major. Was a consultant for eight years, and uh, along the way, what happened is I met my two co-founders, and we were chatting in 2006, and uh, Danae said, I want to create a mutual fund where the people that invest in the mutual fund get to vote on the allocation of the fund. And then I said, well, if you want to change the finance industry, you can't do it in the finance industry. And then she repeated herself again about wanting to create a fund. And I said, well, if you want to change the finance industry, you can't do it in the finance industry. So she repeated herself one more time. And I said the same thing again. And she said, I don't think you understand what I'm saying. And then I said, well, have you heard of YouTube? Now, remember, this is 2006. YouTube is not owned by Google yet. I said, have you heard of YouTube? She said, no, I have not. 
And then I showed it to her and she asked, who puts up these videos? I said, anybody. Well, who watches them? Anybody. Well, how do they find out about them? Well, the people that post them share them with others. And then if they like them, they share them with other people. And before you know it, some people maybe come to the site and they'll search for things. And algorithmically, YouTube will decide who gets to see what. She said, I love it. I'm like, yeah, you want YouTube for money. She's like, what does that look like? Well, instead of just videos, people can say what they want and how to raise money. And if they want to watch it or fund it, they could. And that was the origin of Indiegogo, which was basically YouTube for money. And then we launched in January 2008. We wanted to do it for financial instruments, meaning for profit and equity. But because of various regulations, we couldn't do that. And then um, we launched, actually, we were the first site. The word crowdfunding did not exist in January 2008. And now today, just accelerate fast forward, uh, we've done almost $2 billion of volume in virtually every country of the world. We send money to about 70 countries a week. And uh, we have over 10 million backers that have used the experience for over 800,000 projects. And we get about 15 million visits a month. So, so just to give, us, give people a sense of the... How it works? Well, how it works, but how it works, but also the scope. You know, what's the largest thing you funded? What's an example of something very small, but maybe interesting or significant that you funded? Uh, well, super tiny and interesting would be the first ever crowdfunded baby. So a couple was unable to afford insurance, and the insurance companies would not uh, fund them because they had too high of a risk of being able to get pregnant. They were a couple from Florida, and they got onto Indiegogo just simply to raise enough money to fail at IVF. They were able to raise enough money and they actually had IVF and they actually had got pregnant and now they have like an eight-year-old child. It actually had a new, huge New York Times article that came out of it and it spawned an entire industry by itself. Now tens of thousands of babies are born through funding that happens on crowdfunding sites, but the first one ever was on Indiegogo. Do investors get equity in the baby? You get to name the child. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It struggles when more than one person funds it. Yeah. yeah well, it's hard to agree. Um, but if you want to talk about much bigger and what we're more focused on these days as entrepreneurs, uh, we have lots of Chinese examples, but I'll give you a couple of examples first that are uh, global beyond that. Um, we actually had something very interesting called Flowhive. Flowhive is actually new technology in how to harvest honey. So honey, believe it or not, is based on technology as well. It's based on that white box that you probably are familiar with that somebody puts on a, a suit that covers themselves and then they use smoke to get the bees out and they get the honey and they carve it out. That's that, that box is actually technology from about the mid 1800s. It's been the same technology that's been used for about 150 years. The wild thing is somebody, a father-son combo from Australia, came up with a brand new approach, which is why do you have to put on the suits? Why do you have to smoke them out? Why do you have to upset the bees? So what they created was their own hive, which actually is like honey on tap, just like beer. So literally what happens is the bees hang out in the hive and they go into the cells and they fill each cell with some honey. Then you just turn a crank and the cells open and by opening up the cells, gravity pulls the honey all the way to the bottom to a pool. You turn the crank again and the cells close and now they're empty again and the bees come back and they're like, huh, I thought I filled this cell. <laughs> I, I guess I did not, so I should fill it. So they fill the cell again and repeat and repeat and repeat. And before you know, you have buckets and buckets of honey that's at the bottom of the uh, hive. And all you need to do is literally open the tap and honey comes out. No one gets stung. The bees don't get upset. So that was actually a campaign on Indiegogo. And it got funded within four weeks in 167 countries. Within four weeks, they raised 12 mil 13, 13 million dollars in four weeks. So that's just showing the scope of how global and how revolutionary a concept like this could be. That company has gone on to do more campaigns and they're crushing it globally. Um, obviously it takes a while before you distribute brand new technology for honey across the world, but it's just showing that technology can be crazy new WeChats or it could be as simple as how honey was harvested from 150 years ago. We also have like electronic bikes that are raising $15 million at a time or you know, wireless earbuds from China called TickPods or OmniCharge, which is a really cool um, battery pack that helps charge things that they raised five million dollars uh, from China in just a matter of weeks. Uh, floating speakers, so like literally uh, a speaker that's floating, levitating on top of so uh, Mars crazy baby. I don't know. There's some people who are like shaking their head. They're like, yeah, I have one of those. So these are just technologies and innovations that are coming out of China as examples. And 
uh, getting funded by the 10 million plus people on Indiegogo? Uh, so let's talk about China. Okay, so, so, so first of all, you, you went through a transition yourself. You were founder, CEO, now you're founder and chief business officer, I think. So I was a uh, founder and then CEO, I'm still a founder, but CEO yes. for a decade. And then, and then along the way, two years ago, I put in my CEO in a CEO. Uh, I then built up a brand new business at Indiegogo, which is the investing business, uh, meaning the for-profit investing business. I then more recently left and I started a venture fund. I've been angel investing for about seven years and now I formally have raised a fund and now I invest in a lot of these companies. Okay, well, we might come back to that, especially if there's a China angle to that. But, um, but, but several years ago, it, it seems like the company decided, you know, China was under leveraged or was, there was a lot of potential. Talk about what you created and why, and then let's talk about how it's performed. Yeah, I actually wouldn't even take credit for it. Uh, we didn't consciously say, I think China is a good market. What happened was Indiegogo, um, since day one, became global very rapidly. And what the takeaway there was is the need for figuring out how to get access to capital was not a US issue. It was an entrepreneurial issue globally and everywhere people were showing their demand. China organically was showing demand as well, and we were having some issues in terms of language or currency and trying to figure out how to service that. What started happening is entrepreneurs from China were really going above and beyond dealing with our product issues of not servicing them well and saying we still want to use Indiegogo. We want to figure it out, we really want to use Indiegogo. And about three, four years ago, it was just so organic, the growth in Chinese entrepreneurs wanting to use Indiegogo, that we really leaned into it. And now it's hands down our fastest growing market, growing easily over 70% a year. Uh, we're doing $150 million in the last three years alone of Chinese volume of entrepreneurs. The way you could think about um, the Chinese entrepreneur, and you all probably know this a lot better than me, but this is the way we think about it, is there's a lot of people in China, right? And there's also a lot of entrepreneurs in China, which means there's tons of competition, tons of competition. And a lot of them know how to do manufacturing or they're connected to somebody to do manufacturing and everybody is trying to find their edge. And what happens is let's imagine there's the widget. So there's one widget and there's a competitive market for that widget, which is 50 companies all competing in China. And what happens is what they figured out is if they can come to Indiegogo and we can help do the storytelling with them, and we can bring their product first to market in the US and in Europe globally, they could get all this attention and validation. Now what happens is they could bring it back to China and have a lot more of a story to compete with, not just saying we're the cheapest. And they're able to actually get a lot more margin and they're actually able to get a lot more CAC, customer acquisition cost, down because they've nailed it on Indiegogo with that storytelling. And we're seeing this happening over and over from that side, which is a Chinese entrepreneur, trying to figure out how to do storytelling, how to get people embracing their product. They get that in the US and westernize it, and they're able to bring it back to China and make a ton of money. Now on the flip side, what we're having is a lot of US or European entrepreneurs that are funding <clears throat> through the same channels, and they're trying to figure out how to better execute in terms of bringing their products to life, and we're able to give them the right partnerships in China with manufacturers and figure out how to do fulfillment, et cetera, et cetera. So those are the two sides of how we work on it. Uh, and it's, like I said, hands down, the fastest growing country uh, is China for the last three years. And uh, it's been quite amazing. So I, I want to drill down on that. So um, I had thought of crowdfunding platforms like Indiegogo as essentially neutral platforms where people would raise money. But it sounds like you're, if I hear you right, you're talking about a whole value add where you're providing, it sounds like consulting services or, or something that's not, not a neutral, here's how you could raise money, but that we're going to actually help you, as you said, tell your story, develop your business. Can you, can you, am I right about that? And can you talk more about so that? So the wedge into the market is definitely the money. Uh, people are looking for money. But I'll tell you, a lot of these Chinese entrepreneurs, they're not just looking to try to get 100 grand or $500,000. Sometimes they have other access to raise or get that half a million dollars. What they're looking for is how to package uh, their product in a way that it goes to market that can break through and it sounds unique and it sounds different. And because of that, it'll then sell better in various markets, specifically China. So yes, we do have a service that's above and beyond just a self-serve of you just throw up your product on Indiegogo, have at it, which that's totally possible. Anybody here can literally, while we're talking, set up an Indiegogo campaign and try to start fundraising. But if you wanna have a very interesting electronic bike 
that you want to differentiate versus the hundred other electronic bikes that are out there. And you want to speak about what are the perks, meaning the products that you're providing in return, what are the sales points, uh, how are you differentiating. We help you with all of that. Plus, we help you think about how to set up your landing pages, your marketing packages, how you do your performance marketing, like through Google or Facebook, et cetera, et cetera. And we work with them on all of those things uh, to help optimize their storytelling. And who's we? I mean, who, have you you've, you've brought in teams of people who are? We is Indiegogo. We have yeah. employees, and this is what people do. We have an entire services business inside of Indiegogo. Uh, so we acquire campaign owners. Sometimes it's organic through SEO or just Google. Sometimes it's through our sales channels where we do hand-to-hand -hand contact of getting to know these entrepreneurs, sometimes for a year or three years before they even launch. Along the way, we get to know what they're looking for, what help they need, and if we could help them in any way to optimize, we do, and often that's a win-win for everybody because instead of them raising 100 grand, we could help them raise 2 million. Uh, that's better for everybody because our revenue model is we get a percentage of all money that's raised. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so, you're, so it sounds like you're not raising money for Chinese companies indigenously to develop their business back home. Right? We are. Chinese companies that are in China, they want to build their company in China, but what they're doing is they're using the storytelling of the US and the market validation in the US or Europe to then use that as a differentiator back in China because the other 49 companies didn't do that. So when that one company gets to say that, they get to have higher margin. Said it very different, simply, that's Apple. Apple has generally the same product that many other computers have but they just have much better storytelling, much better marketing, and because of that, we pay a premium, which is brand, and their customer acquisition is lower for that reason, which is a lot of these Chinese entrepreneurs often don't have that storytelling capability, and we help them do that through these campaigns. Okay, so, so what you were starting before, but what are some examples of companies that, that are starting to take some of those steps or who have succeeded? Yeah, yeah, so one is uh, TickPod, which uh, you know how Apple came out with those wireless earbuds uh, so TickPod is basically uh, equivalent in terms of abilities, but at a much cheaper price point. Uh, a really cool product is actually Segway. came out with a uh, go-kart. I don't know if you know the uh, Segway, like from a decade ago that you like hang, you know, you, you drive on with, and it's parallel, like the police in New York sometimes use them. Well, uh, a Chinese company bought those assets and they created something called the Segway 9Bot, which is a go-kart that has some of that technology and it goes from, uh, it goes quite rapidly in just two seconds. It goes 12 mi zero to 12 miles an hour in two seconds, uh, an electronic go-kart. So they were able to raise like a million and a half dollars in a few weeks or OmniCharge, which uh, is just a great battery pack to take around with you. They raised $5 million in several weeks. Uh, really, there are dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of these examples uh, from China that are being funded on Indiegogo. And the funding is done not in renminbi. It's done in That's correct. U.S. dollars or other That's correct. Sort of outside currencies. So is there is there? We're not issue? actually we're not actually selling. Our target market is not the Chinese funder. Right. That's not what the Chinese entrepreneur is looking for. The Chinese entrepreneur is looking for specifically non-Chinese backers mm -hmm. because they want to be able to say that we got all this validation outside of China, so then they could get a higher premium back in China. Interesting. So then are you able to, are the people who raise money able to transfer that money easily back to China for local operations? So the simple, let's call it, setup there is they would have a Hong Kong bank account. Uh, and probably our city person can help us figure all this out. But uh, no, they would have a, a Hong Kong bank account. Obviously, there's challenges related to bringing money in or out of China. Um, and yeah, we've already figured that out at scale. Yeah, that's cool, right? Okay, okay. Um, all right, so from your perspective, so, so you're talking about telling, you know, creating stories for people to tell to validate their business. Um, you know, Chinese business people, entrepreneurs are sometimes you know, knocked for not being original, not being creative, for being very good at you know, copying ideas that originate elsewhere and tailoring them to the local market. What, what's your perspective on that? I mean, I think both of those things are true. I think that I don't actually have a problem with, uh, let's say, you've seen that something else is working and you try to innovate on top of that. Uh, there's not that many new things in the world. Um, that said, I do think China is innovating with a lot of their things, but like the tick pods, uh, is tick pods their own innovation or did they see with Apple and they're trying to have a competitive set? Uh, 
I'm directionally okay with both of it. I think there is a lot of unique innovation, but there is also a lot of just uh, incremental innovation that's happening. And when you talk about investors for the, so, so my experience with Indiegogo, you know, my son has used it to, you know, buy a sandwich practically. I mean, really sort of friends and family giving money for really kind of modest things, relatively modest things. Is there a sort of investor class that's, that's different that is, you know, do you offer equity uh, for, you know, big investors who come in or other rewards or something like that? What's the model these days? Yeah, so your concept around getting a sandwich that does exist, uh, it doesn't really exist on Indiegogo anymore because uh, we, uh, let's call it, uh, got rid of that business. That's really somebody el- more of somebody else's business. The concept of like personal causes and nonprofits, we really focus on the entrepreneurs helping them to stand up their businesses and to sustain their businesses. So we're very much, our customer is the entrepreneur. Um, so that's kind of the, from that standpoint. In terms of the types of people, um, yeah, we definitely have an investor class. We actually did offer for a couple of years investment opportunities. A lot of these Chinese opportunities that I'm talking about, none of them you can invest in. So you can't actually put in $100 and try to get 1000 back. Um, we have had that as part of the Jobs Act. Uh, we did over 100 different offerings. We also did uh, a blockchain-based offering as an STO, and now we're going to go a little bit off the rails here, but a security token offering where I actually originated the, um, the uh, St. Regis Hotel in Aspen, a $230 million asset, and they sold about $18 million of that uh, on the blockchain using Indiegogo as a marketing partner, and that was an actual investment. Um, but that is a f- very small part of the business. The main part of the business is this... Um, perks-based, product-based, pre-selling, or as they call it, crowdfunding. So, so g- give an example of how that would work. You know, with was it TikTok or or, or yeah? So no. TikTok, there's an entrepreneur. They come up with the idea. Um, they want to be able to validate their idea before they scale it. Obviously, you don't need validation. You can just pump you know five million dollars into the business and hope it works. Uh, but instead, you're able to use these internet techniques to now minimize your risk and to not have to get as much dilution if you're going for VC or other capital, what you do is then you just, uh, it's kind of fake it till you make it, right? Which is you show one prototype, see if people are interested, you figure out what your customer acquisition costs and channels are, and then if you're actually able to get some scale, it's called 100,000, 500,000, a million, five million dollars, you've basically created the playbook. And now you can actually go to the manufacturers instead of having to have to pay up front and not know if anybody's gonna buy it, you're like, oh, I actually sold 3,000 units, please make them. Right, because you already know that people paid for them. You have the credit card information. They've already paid for your products, right? So this concept of like coming up with an idea and having to spend the money to then figure out if somebody is going to buy it is a crazy concept. That is what people did, you know, 20 years ago, or even some people still do it now. I don't know why, because you can actually have people tell you that they will buy it and get their money before you spend any of it, which is negative working capital which is a good thing to have. So, Dinda, sorry, Ms. Elliott. She's like, yeah, the negative working capital <laughs> is very... <Yeah. laughs> Don't go to business school, I just told you the lesson. Negative working capital. <laughs> um, Dinda was talking about how, you know, to, to a certain extent, in technology in particular, that China and the U.S. are possibly on, on different, you know, parallel but different paths. That the, the Chinese internet is practically unique, that you know, Chinese use of social media is certainly very different from, from that in the U.S. and elsewhere in the West, that what China does with AI, with quantum, you know, could be very, very different from what's happening in the West. As a technology guy, I mean, do, do you see that? Do you think about that? Is that a good thing, bad thing, neutral thing? What's your thought on that? I'm going to disclaim it with I do not feel like I am a China expert. I just am an experienced person working with China. Um, that said, that... I think competition is great. I think having different ways of looking at things is great. The winner in competition is usually the consumer uh, because they get the best results. Um, obviously, there's government and politics layered into that and policies that somehow, sometimes I would say interferes. But um, whether it's Russia or China or India or Brazil or any country innovating or I think uh, competition is great, and I think China is definitely on the cutting edge of a lot of innovation. Yeah. I mean, you, I would say you are uh, very optimistic sounding. I mean, you're, you're growing in China. You're sort of very optimistic. 
What's going on here? I mean, is it, is it because you're essentially offshore and don't have to deal with some of the complexity that... Why is it working with us? Yeah, I mean, yes. I mean, the answer, I think, is simple there. Um, to be perfectly direct, I don't think we're letting, having anybody in China get upset at us. We're not, if you think about what I'm telling you, is we're helping the Chinese entrepreneurs be stronger in the Western world and in China, and we're not stealing any of the funding that the Chinese competition would have with us from their Chinese backer. We're not taking any of that, right? And we're creating an entire top of funnel of entrepreneurs that need to use Chinese services. So if anything, China like wants to adopt us, right? So like, there's, there's nothing that we're really doing that's uh, upsetting anybody in China, uh, which is why I think it's working. And we just uh, organically figured out how to make that work. Does that work in every business, in every industry, in every model? I'm sure it does not. Um, yeah. So that said, and if I wanted to much think much bigger, which I could, I could be like, oh, this is a big scheme. Eventually, I'm gonna, you know, compete in China with my crowdfunding business against JD and all that, which could be the vision. And I'm sure when we do that, they'll be upset, or they'll buy us, or they'll try to buy us. Well, so that's what I was gonna ask. I mean, that probably is the vision, right? I mean, wouldn't wouldn't you want to be in? First of all, could you be in China, uh, raising local funds, uh, competing I mean, against JD? I think it's possible. I think there's a lot of regulatory and operational challenges. Um, I think it's definitely possible. I think you need significantly more scale. You know, if if the Ubers of the world have challenges, you know, we have significant scale to reach before we feel like that could be very competitive. Mm -hmm. So how do you how do you connect with entrepreneurs in China? How do you yeah? How do they know about you? Originally, three four years ago, before we had our let's call it China program, it happened completely organically. Um, entrepreneurs would see us speak, they would Google on Google, they would uh, connect to other entrepreneurs that used it. Uh, it just happened very uh, by accident, let's say, or through our own systems. Now we very much have developed our China program. We have boots on the ground in China, in Hong Kong, in Shenzhen. Uh, there's actually people there that work for Indiegogo uh, and are much more on the ground uh, sourcing and servicing these opportunities. Uh, and we're much, we actually have, uh, you know, Mandarin speakers that we hire on purpose in America, meaning not the Chinese, you know, people that are on the ground, but we actually have Mandarin support, account managers, people that are supporting the development of this content creation. Um, yeah, so we, I would say we've definitely like leaned into building out our China business. Yeah. All right, so last question, because we're almost out of time. You said you're not a China guy, but you're right here, center stage at a China Institute event, so... I'm going to ask you. Yes. Um, what? So I would assume people you work with or friends or whatever uh, think, you know, China has been demonized, I would say, uh, by everyone from our president to our media to practically everybody these days. You know, China's view of the U.S. also contains maybe similar hostility these days. What's your, I mean, how, what, what's your perspective and how do you respond to people who just think, man, you know, you're going you're gonna to get burned in this? I mean, you got to be respectful of a situation and you can't just be ignorant. And so you need to enter any of that eyes wide open. Um, so I think we're just executing day, you know, one day at a time. You know, we've definitely rubbed up against our own problems and navigated it. And we also have a lot of positive results. My point of view on somebody just like telling me some high level quote of propaganda about why one country is good or bad or whatever. Um, is meaningless to me. I think that's just politicians using very short snippets to try to get clickbait, to try to give their position. Uh, it doesn't actually speak to any like actual experiences as to what it's like to interact with a country, nevertheless a person that lives in that country, because that's what it's all about is your experiences. And uh, we've had perfectly good experiences. I've been to China multiple times. I love going um, and I think people should make their own decisions based on their own experiences and not like little snippets from either country's politicians. Thank you, Dr. Kissinger. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Slava. That was great. That was so terrific. Thank you very, very much.